Good evening, family and friends. Jesus the Light welcomes you. One more time to a meeting on Saturday night, 7 p.m., to take our journey in the Bible again. One more time, that the things that the Lord speaks of, he gives to us for a reason. And that reason is to lead us through this life here on earth, to prepare us for the time when we will depart and be with him in heaven. Many times we think of when someone passes from this from this world that it's a bad thing and we weep because of it. Well, we do, because we're going to miss them. We will miss them. We do miss them. I've experienced that firsthand. But the thing that many times we forget that if they belong to Jesus, we will again see them one day. And not only that, they are in a much better place because Satan cannot get to them any longer. Satan cannot tempt him. He cannot deceive him. So that's a blessing. Where we're still tempted and we're still, he's still trying to deceive us. And, and many times it, he does. I'm not saying that I'm perfect or anyone of us is perfect, because we're not. Not at this point. Not as long as we're here on this earth, we will make mistakes. But praise the Lord, we have a Redeemer. And that Redeemer is Jesus. And he says that there is only one sin that will condemn us that there is no forgiveness for. And that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So we need to be very cautious. A lot of the times when we see things and, and hear of things, how we react, how we interact, and what our mindset is when we hear these things. We need to understand that we are in the sight of Jesus at all times because he told his disciples when he was ready to ascend into heaven that he had to go, but a comforter would come. And that comforter is his spirit. He said, it will be one like him. Well, that's the third part of the Godhead that the word speaks of, the Trinity. The Bible, there, I never have found in the Bible where it says Trinity. But there is three in one. It says it in James chapter five. But there, those three are one. Well, it also says it in, in John in John 17, where it says, Jesus is talking and he says, Father, I am in you and you are in me. And he goes on to say that he is in us and we are in him. And what he's talking about here is spirit. He's not talking about natural. He's talking about spiritual. And many times we need to understand that, that he talks about spiritual things all through the word. Many times we take it as the natural, but it's when you get an understanding that only the Holy Spirit can give you through the baptism of the Holy Spirit after you're born again, then you, you gain an understanding of the word 
that you don't have prior to that. I know it was that way with me. Before I rededicated my life to the Lord, I would read the Bible and it was like Greek to me. But then, when he came into my truck, and I felt it, I literally felt him come into my truck, sit down by the side of me, and ask me if I was tired of where I was. The only answer that I could give him was yes. So in that, he asked me if I was willing and that willing, word willing is very important because he doesn't want to force us into anything. But as long as we're willing to give ourselves to him, then that's when the truth hits, hits and we begin to understand what he's saying. We begin to understand his word. When you go into the book of Acts where, where Peter was speaking to the house of Cornelius. And the word says that as Peter, as Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles, filled them with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues. Now, some, some have a problem with speaking in tongues. Now, I do if it's abused, but I know that there is a language that is beyond our mental capacity to understand because it is spirit, it's communication between us and the Lord. So when we begin to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, to have our minds open to what the Word is saying, we begin to see and understand how important it is that the Holy Spirit come and infill us. Because the Lord told the disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait. Wait for the promise of the Father. Jesus had told them prior to his death that, that they would receive the promise. Did they know what that was? I don't believe they did. But they went to Jerusalem and waited. And when you get down and, and study the feast and, and the times when Jesus was crucified and he spent 40 days on the earth after he was crucified, before he ascended into, earth, into heaven, the, the time between his ascending into heaven and the Holy Spirit coming into the upper room and infilling the 120 that was there which was 10 days. So that happened on the day of Pentecost. These dates are very, very significant to what the Lord is doing. But John the Baptist, as he was baptizing, he told the people that he baptized with water unto repentance. Now, unto repentance, unto means into something. So it would be unto, into repentance of your sins. This was something entirely new to the people because they were used to living under the law, the Mosaic law. But they no longer lived there after Christ came. He set us free from the law. And I'll read something in a moment that will, will show you that John baptized with water unto repentance, but Jesus baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. There's a big difference, big difference, because that, that, Baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, it builds something inside of a person that they have boldness that they never had before. 
they have an understanding of God's word that they never had before. And when they preach, there is a power that comes with that because of that zeal, the power of the word. And when we begin to understand that authority, that power and authority that is in the word of God, it changes the heart of man, not the mind. When a person has a true born again experience, they know the difference between an emotional relationship with the Lord and a spiritual relationship. So as we are talking, I'd like for you to, if you have your Bible with you, if you don't, I'll give you a few minutes to go get it. And But I, I would like for you to have a Bible because there, there are scriptures that, well, I'll probably just go to this one because the Lord last night about between 2 and 2.30 in the a.m. woke me and gave me the scripture. Now, many times I don't know why he does that to me, but I know someone that is listening tonight or will listen later on needs this scripture, needs to understand what the Holy Spirit is saying in this scripture. And it's about your walk. It's about your walk. How do you walk? How does the world see you as a Christian? I heard a saying one time, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would they find enough evidence to find you guilty? I pray they would. I pray that all of us, when we walk in the spirit with Jesus, that they would definitely, without looking very hard, find enough to find us guilty of having a relationship with Jesus. The word says man can destroy the body, but we're not to fear the one who can just destroy the body, but fear the one who can destroy the body and the soul. So when we fear him, now there's a, there's a difference in the fear that he's talking about here and a fear of a natural disaster or something. But this fear is a respect for the Lord, a respect for him, what he has done, doing, and is going to do, that we recognize him in everything, every aspect of our life that we will recognize him. I would like for you to turn in your Bible to the book of Romans. And as you're turning there, I pray that the Lord will open your heart, open your mind to receive what he has for you. Because this scripture is for someone, maybe more than just one. But there's there's something in the scripture that is going to help your walk with the Lord from this point forward in your life. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 1. Many have read this, many have quoted it, and I've heard it quoted many times. But they stop at the one verse, and they don't get the full thought of the writer of the book of Romans. And in order to get that full thought that the writer had, you had to go all the way to the 11th verse and through the 11th verse. It says, there is therefore 
Now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now here we are, walking according to the flesh or according to the Spirit. The question that you ask yourself is, do I walk according to the flesh? Or do I walk according to the Spirit? And if you're walking according to the flesh, you're partaking of the things of the world that the Lord very explicitly tells us not to partake of in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and Galatians chapter 5. Now you can go there, write that down, because you can go there and find out the things that you should not walk in. Not only that, in Galatians, it tells you the evidence of walking in the Spirit. And we'll, we'll, we'll come to that uh, in, in Galatians before the night's out. But for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me, get personal about this, has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, the serpent in the garden told Eve, you shall not surely die if you partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, he, was, he had convinced her that she would not physically die but what he forgot to tell her is what God said. If you eat of this, you shall surely die. God was talking spiritually. Satan was talking carnally. Go on with this now. In, in verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the like likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. On account of sin. Because of the sin in the garden. And it goes on down from generation to generation, even to our day. Jesus was sent to the earth because of that sin. That's the reason he came. He came to die on the cross. That was his goal when he entered the body that the Lord had prepared for him, the Father had prepared for him. He condemned sin in the flesh. How did he do that? By going to the cross, shedding his blood, being raised from the dead, now set at the right hand of the Father. That the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. What are the things of the flesh in your life? The things of the world. The things that we desire that's anything other than heavenly things. And as we begin to understand that when we look out across the world and we see we see all this beautiful stuff God's created, there's nothing wrong with the things that God has created. It's what man has made of them that we have to be aware of. And that only comes through a sinful nature 
Man prides himself of knowledge, prides himself of things that take place in the natural. But does he ever think of things that take place in this going on? But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now, the things of the Spirit is, Lord, what is your will for me today? What is your will? What do you want me to do for you? You see, he doesn't need us for anything. But he wants us to be a part of what he's doing. He wants you to be a part of what he's doing. And there's such a blessing, such a joy that we receive when we are obedient to what he asks us to do. Things of the Spirit. Jesus told the woman of the well when they were talking about worshiping, some worship in the mountains, some in Jerusalem, and all that. Jesus said that God, Father, is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. For he is spirit. We are a three-part being. We're the body, we're, we're what you see here and here. This is what God created, but it houses our spirit and our soul. Our spirit is what God communicates us through. Our soul is our mind, our will, and our motion, emotion. So when you think about these things, think of what the devil's playground is. The devil's playground is this up here. He loves to get into our mind. I had something take place today in my life that disturbed me greatly. And I won't go into what that was, but that was the devil playing with my mind. And I had to cut it off. I had to just shut it down. Because Satan was beginning to move in. And I said, no, no more. You can't do this. Because I have authority over you. I have the power of the name of Jesus living in me. And he, Jesus, has given me the authority to use the power that is in his name against all the power of the enemy. You can find that in Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Luke chapter 10, starting, or you read verse 1, and then go to 18 and 19. I believe it's 18 and 19. But I would suggest that you read that entire, entire chapter, chapter 10 of Luke. Give you a good insight to what the authority that we have over the enemy, that we don't have to walk according to the flesh. Because when Jesus lives in us, we are no longer functioning in the flesh. We are functioning in the spirit. And as I continue reading in Romans chapter 8, we're down to verse 6 now. It says, for to be carnally minded is death, but spiritually minded is life and peace. So when something other than peace is coming over your life, you recognize very quickly where that's coming from. Because it's your flesh rising up, 
trying to usurp your spirit, trying to take over. Your soul is trying to take over because Satan wants to take over your soul and kick your spirit out of the out of the throne. Kick the spirit of God out of his throne room. Because we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You can you can research that and you'll find it. But to be carnally minded is death. Was was Eve carnally minded when she was tempted in the garden by, by Satan? She began to function in a, in a, in a carnal mind set. Carnal mindset. Because what did, what did Satan tempt her with? He tempted her with knowledge. He told her that it would make her wise. And the fruit would be pleasing to the eye. When you go and read the fall or Satan tempted Eve, I think it's in the third chapter of Genesis. And you read that, you will see that uh, Satan used everything that appealed to the flesh to tempt Eve and got her away from thinking spiritually because she didn't know good from evil until she submitted to that temptation see temptation is not a sin to us the sin of that temptation is us taking a part in it us accepting that and and falling prey to it falling prey to that deception that's where the sin comes in. But we have an advocate. Let's go on. Verse 7. Because the carnal mind, here we go, is enmity against God. Think about that. For it is not subject to the law of God. See, Jesus came that he could awaken our spirit. He could awaken our spirit that had gone to sleep because of sin. Nor uh, subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Let me go back and reread that. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh, in the flesh, cannot please God. If you're walking in the flesh, you're walking in sin. If you're walking in the spirit, you have become born again, born of water and spirit, just like Jesus told Nicodemus in chapter 3, I think it's of John. These scriptures, write them down and go back and check them out. And let me know what, what is the Lord is speaking to you on it. But you are not, chapter or verse 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Does the spirit of God dwell in you? I'm not answering or asking. You need to ask yourself. Is the Spirit of God really in you? Does he have his abode in you? Does he live in you? Can the world see the light of Jesus in you? I, I check myself constantly when things come at me. 
What does the world see in how I act, react, and accept things that are spoken? The world watches you like a hawk. If you say you're first thing say when you if you do something wrong, they'll say, the Christians don't act like that. You cannot be a Christian. Well, we make mistakes too. But we need to recognize those mistakes, learn from them, and ask. Jesus to forgive us of our shortfalls, our sin, because Satan will tempt us and he'll get us to stumble. I know by experience he does. Okay, verse 10. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness go look up what righteousness means what the word righteousness means didn't even bring a, a completely new light on the word righteousness and how it affects your life and those lives around you but if the spirit of him who raised jesus from the dead dwells in you here again, question, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, who is that? It's Father. It's Father. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body. Didn't it say over here? That your body is dead because of sin? How does this take place? It takes place through his spirit who dwells in you. How does Jesus take his place in your temple? I should say in his temple in you it comes through repentance i had a my wife ask a pastor one time how do i know when i sin and the pastor looked at her and kind of smiled he says go out and sin and you'll find out very quickly the holy spirit will convict you i can guarantee it he will let you know right now. But he provided a way for you. He provided a way. Father, forgive me for I have sinned. Now, remember what David said when Nathan came to him and spoke to him about what he had done with Bathsheba? David told when he repented, he said, Father, I have sinned against you. He didn't say he had sinned against Bathsheba or her husband, which he had killed, by the way. But he said, Father, I have sinned against you. And what did Father say about him? He's a man after God's heart. Do you want to be a person after God's heart? I know I do. I know that I do not want to go back to my prior life because I thought I was having fun at the time, but believe me, I did, I was not. I would go out and party and I would drink and and I would stay out till two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, come in, and what would happen the next morning when I'd wake up? Father didn't condemn me. What he did though was 
He said, how do you feel? That's all he said. And for about three years, you talk about long suffering. God is long suffering because he, he put up with my stupidity that long. But every Saturday morning, every Sunday morning, I'd wake up, sit on the edge of the bed, and I would hear his voice. How do you feel? Nothing else. How do you feel? Lord, I'll be fine when it comes noon because I can start drinking again. Was I an alcoholic? I don't believe I was. I just drank. Because when, when he took that away from me, I'll share a little story with you. When, when he came into my truck that time, and I got home that evening, and on the way home, he said, Sherman, I want you to go to the liquor cabinet. I want you to take every bit of the alcohol and pour it down the drain. So when I got home, I, I counted it up, and I had about, people had given it to me, about five gallons of bourbon, and the seals were not even cracked on it. My wife told me, she says, why don't you give that to, to so-and-so? I said, I may as well drink it to myself if I'm going to cause them to stumble. I can't do that. So I opened up those bottles. I tipped them up in the sink. I'll bet you that entire town of truth and consequences was drunk just from the vapor coming up out of the sewer. But I got rid of it all. Never touch another drop again. Never. I won't even drink a beer. And the reason I won't drink a beer is the Lord told me one time, he says, what kind of an example do you set? He said, if you take a new Christian that was an alcoholic and the Lord delivered him from alcohol, set him free, never desired another drop of it, and they see you with a beer in your hand, what are they going to think? This is the Lord speaking to me. And I got to thinking about it and what they would think would be, if it's if he can do it, I can. There's nothing wrong with it. Well, no. When you call yourself a Christian, when you present your to your family and your friends to be a Christian, and you call cause someone to stumble in your actions, what you'll be accounted for. The Lord will hold you accountable. So be careful. What does the word say? Be wise as, wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. So present your body as a living sacrifice, as the word says. Present your body as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Now, am I saying we can't have fun? We can't enjoy ourselves? No, I was saying we can have glorious fun. Thank you, Helen. We can have glorious fun. We can enjoy ourselves like never before. Because we can wake up the next morning and know how we got home. We can wake up the next morning and not hear that voice. How do you feel? You wake up the next morning and say, Father, thank you for another day. What do you have planned for us today? How can I be of help to you? Who do you want me to speak to? If you want me to speak to someone, bring them to me. Or me to them. Tell you how the Lord deals with with sometime whenever you when you have something in your heart. There was one time 
the Lord sent me to a meeting and I I gave a prophetic word and the leader said Sherman go to the back and the other prophets will be there to judge what you've said well there was five five men came back along with the moderator and all of them agreed that it was a word from the Lord except one and that one looked at me straight in the eye and said you're striving that cut me to the quick especially when the others had said it was a word from the Lord and I carried that for quite a few years and about two days before Christmas one year not that long ago a few years ago the Lord said I want you to go and apologize to that man I said Lord I didn't do anything to that man he was the one, and I was pointing the finger at the other guy. And the Lord said, I'm not dealing with him, I'm dealing with your heart. When he said that, I said, Lord, you set it up, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him, I'll ask him for forgiveness. My niece called my wife and said, I want to go to a Bible bookstore. I want to buy something for Sherman for Christmas. So my wife said to me, she says, you want to go? And I said, no, I don't want to go. And she says, well, if you, if you do decide to go, you're going to have to be in some other part of the, uh, the bookstore because she wants to get you something for Christmas and she doesn't want you to know. So that's fine. So I went with her, got to the bookstore, and I was going over in some of the books on spiritual warfare. And I was talking to a pastor that was standing there. And we had this conversation going back and forth. I felt someone behind me to look at something else that, that I was looking at. So I kind of moved to the side. I looked back and moved to the side, and here's this man standing there. I couldn't believe it. And I said, you and I need to get to break together for breakfast sometime. And he says, how about tomorrow? <laughs> I thought to myself, this quick, Lord? The day before Christmas? And the Lord said, yes. So we met. The next morning at an IHOP, and he got there before I did. And when I got there, I and sat down at the table, and, and uh, before we had even ordered, I said, "There's something, Charlie. There's something I need to ask your forgiveness for." And he looked at me, okay. So I told him the circumstance. He said, "I don't know what you're talking about." I don't remember anything about that. See, I was the one held in prison. It was me who was behind bars because of the condition of my heart. When we walk in the spirit, we have to be aware of the condition of our heart. Because if we hold animosity against someone, The Lord's going to hold us accountable, and he's going to ask us to straighten that out. And we have to. There, there comes a time also that when we're ministering to someone, and I have had this happen to me numerous times when we were having meetings in, in my home, that when we were through doing what the Lord wanted us to do in that person's life, it was time for them to go. Because the Lord had a plan for them, and he didn't want them to pitch their tent there. And I know 
that there's certain times that we have to cut the children loose. We have to say, get out of the nest. Get out of the nest. I saw a vision of two eagles flying up the canyon. Big, deep canyon. Must have been 500, 5 to 800 feet deep. And these two eagles built a nest on an outcropping right over that canyon. There was nothing between the edge of that nest and the floor of the canyon. And as it a division progressed, like two eggs. The eggs hatched, the eagles fed, raised them up to a point. And there was one eagle. When he got big enough, he was flapping his wings on the side of the side of the nest. And all of a sudden he jumps off. Down he goes, straight to the bottom of the canyon. And then all of a sudden, here he rises up. He spread those wings out and he started to fly. This is what we have to do sometimes to people that we're ministering to when God says it's time to cut the cord, time to send them on their way. We have to do that. Sometimes it's very hard because you become very good friends, almost like family, but you have to cut it loose. But that second eagle did not want to jump off. Fear had gripped it. So what, is the, what do the parents do? They start shoving the nest apart, kicking out the feathers and the grass that made it soft. Got it down to the small sticks. The eagle still wouldn't jump. They took the smaller sticks out, only the big ones there. Could not get a resting place. Finally, that second eagle decided, I only have one of two choices. Stay here where I'm uncomfortable or jump off. Well, eventually he jumped off. And the last thing I saw was the two parents flying off back up the canyon. The two blue ones had gone out on their own. That's what the Lord wants. Barbara, you know this as well as I do. You know that there are times when you almost have to push people out. I don't believe that God wants us to to house 10,000 people in a building. When they say to their friends, I've, I've heard him preach that a dozen times. Well, maybe it's time you go out and preach it to the lost. Maybe it's time you get out there and do what the Lord wants you to do. Think about things. The word tonight, do I walk in the spirit or do I walk in the flesh? Do I walk in the freedom that Jesus paid for? Do I walk in that, that power and that authority of his name that speaks of in Luke chapter 9 and chapter 10? Do I walk? And the joy, the peace. I said I was gonna I was gonna go to let me see if I can find it real quick. To Galatians. Uh, Galatians chapter five. Let me start at verse nine here and see if I can see if I can find it. Okay. Here we go. Uh, okay. Works of the flesh. 
the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such things, such there is no law. Freedom, freedom in the spirit. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The Lord has set us free. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. We'll find that in Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 22 and going to the end of the chapter. Very important to know the evidence, the fruit of the Spirit. That will let you know very quickly if you're walking in the flesh or you're walking in the Spirit. Lord bless all of you. I've taken enough of your time tonight. One one more thing before I sign off. This coming Saturday, I got a instant message a couple of weeks ago from this guy in Kenya, in Nigeria. And he wants to have a house meeting. He wants to have a house meeting, but he wants the ministry that he is starting. He wants to start. He wants to go to the outlying areas. And this is what I'm asking prayer for, that uh, he's going to the outlying areas and taking the gospel to the lost in Kenya. Now, like I said, he lives in Nigeria. Now, we're going to do a live video next saturday at 8 30 in the morning my time that would be i think he said 6 30 his time in the a.m or in the p.m rather. so what i need prayer for is the lord will give me what they need to raise them up to be the mighty men that the lord wants them to be through his spirit, through his word. Teach them his word and the truth of his word, that they will be able to take it to the outlying areas and speak a salvation message. He introduced me to two more pastors the other night. He gave me, he called me. Isn't that amazing about Facebook? You can call through Facebook. Around the world, doesn't matter. Or across the street. But pray for me, because I definitely do need prayer. Tonight, the Satan had come against me, and I had this heaviness on my chest. But after the meeting started, it lifted. That shows you that Satan was trying to keep me from being here. I enjoy this. I enjoy it immensely. I enjoy everyone that comes on Saturday night. Invite your family, your friends. Invite house full. Because all of us need encouragement. We need the blessing of the Lord. And I do pray a blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ on all of you. Everyone within the sound of my voice who watches this video, who partakes of God's word, I pray a blessing over you, over your household, over your family, your children, and that the Lord will provide every need for you according to his riches and glory. But most of all, the infilling of his Holy Spirit, where you walk not in the flesh, but according to the Spirit.
God bless you. Lord, keep you. Invite family and friends because I love people. Thank you, Jesus. See you next Saturday night. God bless you.